a week before the Super Bowl happened in Tampa, the Tampa Water District got hacked and somebody tried to poison the water. What? I was totally unaware of that. Mm -hmm. Wow. They stopped it because somebody was literally sitting at the computer and saw someone else moving the mouse. Whoa. That's an unplug the computer moment. Yeah. Holy cow. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Scalable Path. Want to speed up your product development without breaking the bank? Since 2010, Scalable Path has helped over 300 companies hire deeply vetted engineers in their time zone. Visit scalablepath.com slash twist to get 20% off your first month. Northwest Registered Agent. When starting your business, it's important to use a service that will actually help you. Northwest Registered Agent is that service. They'll form your company fast, give you the documents you need to open a business bank account, and even provide you with mail scanning and a business address to keep your personal privacy intact. Visit northwestregisteredagent.com slash twist to get a 60% discount on your next LLC. And Vanta. Compliance and security shouldn't be a deal breaker for startups to win new business. Vanta makes it easy for companies to get a SOC 2 report fast. Twist listeners can get $1,000 off for a limited time at vanta.com slash twist. All right, everybody, we are obsessed in 2023 and now in 2024 with how artificial intelligence is impacting essentially everything we do in business, in life, and government, education. Now, AI gives you, if you're a knowledge worker, so many amazing tools. I'm seeing people on my team get 10%, 20% faster every month just by using these tools. It is bonkers. We've never seen anything like this. But the truth is, if the good guys can get better at their jobs, well, the black hats, the hackers can get better at their jobs as well. Just think about how powerful it is to use a language model to try to convince people of something in one of your blog posts or your email newsletters. In fact, Grammarly lets you set that. Well, <laughs> the same technology can be used by hackers, you know, spoofing emails. And the targets are always businesses, hospitals, critical infrastructure, you know, all that. And the damage from ransomware last year alone, $30 billion. The Department of Homeland Security said ransomware was the second most profitable cyber crime. And so today we have an expert in the field. John Miller is the CEO and co-founder of Halcyon, uh, and they are building products that use AI to stop ransomware attacks before they happen and limit the damage they do. John, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Let's talk a little bit about the threats and ransomware in general. How does practically ransomware go down and who's doing this and what's their motivation? I mean, it's pretty obvious, but I think it's good to hear it from an expert. Yeah, I mean, it's attacker group is growing day after day. It used to be something that was heavily Russian in origin and then into Eastern Europe. And then you'd see some Chinese actors at it. But now we're seeing a renaissance, right? Where people all over the world have figured out that you can just join one of these affiliate programs and you're a ransomware actor. So we're in this interesting spot where, you know, not only do you have AI coming in and adding to automation and, and scale and efficiency, but more and more attackers are coming online now. And they've been kind of bolstered by this economy where, you know, you have these large ransomware groups where, you know, a lot of them have ties to FSB or GRU, and they're actually building the tooling and operating it in a profit sharing capacity with anyone that that wants to partake this is new news to me explain this af how affiliate came to ransomware because if you did have the super weapons to exploit people and do ransomware you would probably want to keep them for themselves but that something seems to have changed here this is the first time hearing about these affiliate programs explain what they absolutely are. so a great example of it is the mgm attack that happened in las vegas and so there were two distinct groups that were involved in it. One of them was called Black Hat. Those guys have ties to Russian intelligence and they're a ransomware group on their own. However, they make their toolkit available to an affiliate network. And so the group that actually carried it out has been called Scattered Spider, which nobody's exactly sure where they are. There was some assumptions that they were based in the United States because 
their English was so good in their written communications. But that's been attributed by some people to the use of LLMs in help building their ransom notes. But it was a completely new attacker group where they didn't have their own tooling and they they split the profits with the, the wow. black hat. Uh, so this is interesting. The the Russians or you know these other groups are now making the tools, they make the weapons, they say, Hey, you go do your activity, chop it up 50-50. Yeah, yeah, they do it too, right? And it's it's all different percentages. Um, but wow. it's not like they stop. The really sophisticated attackers will focus on the more sophisticated targets. And then you have tiers of these attackers where you know, you'll have people that specialize in going out and attacking hospitals, right? Or, you know, hundred million dollar sized manufacturers. It's interesting where you're seeing essentially the internet kind of carved up into territories. Wow. And you have these different attacker groups that just keep kind of uh, rinse and reusing the same techniques and, and tools over and over how do they get away with it? I guess is one of the questions that I think a lot of people have because, you know, the internet, you can be anonymous, but there are ways to trace people. And then when payments become involved, there's ways to trace people. So how do they remain anonymous during the attacks and the communications? And then how do they remain anonymous in the payment area? So the payments are normally done via cryptocurrency, right? Okay. And, you know, Bitcoin is involved, but there are washing services. There are more secure currencies like Monero that are used. But for the most part, there's no consequence. Like, there's no police that are going to come arrest you, right? So 99.99% of, of ransomware cases out there, there's, there's no police that are that are chasing you down no fbi coming and saying hey we need to go stop this at the source would this be happening if crypto had not become so ubiquitous and available or is crypto the the kerosene on this fire i mean crypto is definitely the kerosene on the fire it's really difficult to have someone deliver millions and millions of dollars in cash like logistically it's it's complicated you know, cryptocurrency has, has definitely streamlined the business. It did happen before there was cryptocurrency. I think the biggest thing that's really exploded it is the fact that attackers or people that weren't attackers are realizing that they can really do this consequence free. And, you know, as long as you're not in the US or, you know, um, a first world European nation or something like that, there's no response. The government has, for years, has tried to keep computer hacking um, kind of on the level of espionage, right? Where it's not kinetic, it doesn't merit a kinetic response, and it's it's bled over into this now, where we're not really set up to respond to you know an exponentially growing threat group like this that are you know is completely willing to target our critical infrastructure, our manufacturing. At some point, this is going to be so acute that we're going to have to strike back in the in the real world. And that's pretty obvious. Yeah. I mean, it's obvious. I don't know if it's going to happen. Got it's it. not it's not where policymakers are going, where where they think they can solve it is by making it illegal for people. Mm. to pay the ransom. So if nobody oh, make it leave, illegal to pay the ransom. Yeah. So uh, imagine your business gets ransomed. Or imagine you're a hospital that yeah. gets ransom and you can't provide quality service to your patients, which, you know, results in, in death. Right. Um, telling them that they can't pay a ransom is a, a very precarious spot to be in. But now crypto people always say to me, oh, have fun staying poor, not going to make it. And then when I make these points and then they also add to it, well, Crypto is 100% traced and the blockchain is immutable, blah, 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 blah. Therefore, crypto makes it easier to catch criminals. Is that just them talking their own book and, and trying to protect yeah, themselves? I mean, yeah. you, you can wash cryptocurrency, right? You can put it through laundries, online casinos. There are services specifically for it. You can chain hop, right? Like transfer from Bitcoin to Monero or you know, Monero to 
and woo or whatever you want, Dogecoin, it doesn't matter. There's enough spots where you can mix it around where you, you can't track it anymore. They don't really need to go to that level of extreme because no one's really going after it. It's hard to balance hiring top tier developers and keeping your burn rate under control. But these days, I see a ton of founders successfully doing this by hiring remote talent. So let me tell you about Scalable Path. It's a software staffing company that can help you build an awesome remote developer team. And the right developer isn't just a list of technical skills. We all know that. It's about their personality. It's about their work ethic, their motivation, and their fit within your team. And Scalable Path knows this. So here's what they do. Their team will get to know your vision. They're going to get to know your needs, and then they're going to develop technical challenges tailored to the roles you're hiring for. And these challenges are conducted live and on video. So there's no gaming of the system. You're going to get great people. They also evaluate each candidate's soft skills like communication, attitude, and work style. Scalable Path has completed more than 300 projects for their clients, and they have a network of 30,000 developers. They've been doing this for over a decade. They know what they're doing. So you're going to be in great hands. Here's the best part. Twist listeners get 20% off their first month. If you're ready to scale your dev team and your business, check out scalablepath.com slash twist. Once again, that domain name, scalablepath.com slash twist for 20% off. The interesting thing with ransom, ransomware is you negotiate with these guys, right? Yeah. Like you have live communication with them both in the process after you've been ransomed and you're trying to get unransomed and negotiate how much to pay them, as well as they'll support you after you've paid them to help recover data. So it's Uh, not like they're hiding deeply in the shadows and there's just no need for them to. So when they did this with Caesars and MGM, Caesars, I think, just said, okay, or one of them, Caesars just paid 15 million bucks. Yeah, and they were back online quickly. So what they do is they take down your systems, they somehow lock them up, and they have the data of the individuals. That's the playbook? Yeah. So normally, the first thing they'll do is exfiltrate your data. And they do it like a smash and grab. As fast as they can, they'll overwhelm the connection pipes, but take as much data out as possible. And then what they'll do is they'll run encryption software, where they'll just scour the whole hard disk and create encrypted versions of all the files and then delete the originals. And then you pay them for that key to restore those files. And then they call it double extortion. You pay them to not publicly release the data that they stole. Got it. So they got you two different ways. Yeah. I mean, an an interesting one is, um, I think it was the Black Cat group. I I don't want to uh, offend any ransomware group for uh, attributing something to, to another one. But about a month ago, they actually reported their own breach to the SEC, where they ransomware a company. The company was trying to keep it under wraps. And they, uh, as the attacker, did the disclosure that they were compromised. Yeah, because you do, as a public company, have to disclose these things now. That's part of yeah, the Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And we've had laws, you know, for a bunch of years and, you know, at the state level. And now we're getting more into like SEC mandating uh, reporting. But, you know, the majority of these attacks still go unreported. If you're running a business and if you don't pay your business is going to go under, you're going to figure out what you need to do to pay and just keep it quiet. How do people stop this from happening? Because this is a system level. You need to get keys to the kingdom in order to do one of these things, which means you have to compromise a pretty serious IT person's credentials. Or can you do this with just the CEO's credentials, the CFO's credentials? How do they get into the system? What what level of keys do they need? And then how do you stop it? I know your company obviously has, has tools and services here, but how, how do people practically stop this from happening? Our company specializes in, we've built an endpoint agent that complements kind of antivirus and EDR and provides another layer to stop it. And then if if we miss it, um, actually recover the system, we capture those keys. So instead of having to pay for them, we, we have a copy and we can just use them. The normal ingress for these is like phishing attacks, right? Compromised credentials. There have been so many password breaches over the years that you can take someone's email address 
and essentially figure out what the algorithm is they use in their head for creating passwords, unless they oh, use wow. really random passwords everywhere. And they'll bake that into the, the malware and say, you know, here's, here's what we think five passwords probably are. When you run, you know, try to connect to them. The other interesting thing is there's another essentially marketplace where you have what are called initial access brokers, right? So there is an entire business of all I do is go out and try to get a small landing point inside of a big corporation. And then I turn around and sell that. So if you wanted to be a, a ransomware actor today, you don't have to hack anyone. You go and join a ransomware group. You go to initial access broker, you buy the access, you take the tool that you got from the ransomware group, you, you run it there, you're done. There, ah, so there the are people who... The technical complexity yeah. is low now. Very so low. there's a marketplace now of people who numerous. have hacked... Yeah, numerous ones. They will hack you know, somebody in customer support, somebody who's a receptionist, somebody who's a salesperson, whatever it is, that gets you into the building, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Now you run this malware that you bought. And you you try to it. lateralize, you capture cash passwords off of the host, right? The, the interesting thing is these, these ransomware guys have a lot of money now. This is really successful. So they can go out and do things like buy zero-day vulnerabilities. Right? Explain what that is to people. Yeah. Um, a zero-day vulnerability is a flaw in a piece of software that nobody knows is there. So an individual researcher goes out and says, I figured out how to hack Chrome browser in a way that nobody knows. Instead of telling anyone or disclosing it, you know, there are ransomware groups like Lockbit that run open bug bounty programs. You just reach out to them, you tell them what you found, and they'll pay you for it. And then they'll build oh. that into their malware. So this hacker, the, the black hats are offering bounties. A hundred percent. Against Microsoft offering bounties or whoever. And guess who pays more? I'm going to guess the people who do ransomware pay more. Well, they make money with it, right? Yes. And, yeah. and so I think it was like two or three years ago, we hit a point where those types of vulnerabilities were almost exclusively used by governments, right? intelligence agency stuff like that then we hit a point where these these cyber criminals are actually using more of these zero day vulnerabilities than than anyone else fascinating so explain how language models and ai has changed the game uh, because we knew it would um, is it just people are writing clever emails now i mean you would be amazed at how much ransomware starts with phishing and i'm sure you've gotten more phishing emails than you can count in your life. Yeah. And normally they're pretty easy to pull off when it's like, this is broken English. Like this isn't yeah. legit. I mean, you can use an LLM to generate a phishing site for you. I don't think that it's really widely being used by the ransomware groups. They don't really need it, but it is another um, kind of fueling factor. That's just allowing them to grow even more. You get, 10%, 20% performance uptick if you use it, right? Cut out some of the, the busy work and give a, a finished product that's going to be more successful. The thing I, I've recently uh, been made aware of, because I'm in the venture capital space, there are large wires that sometimes, you know, somebody gets a distribution. So a wire goes out, yeah. you're in a venture fund, you're an LP, and we're shipping, you know, oh, we're distributing the stock from Coinbase or Airbnb or from Uber. It's got to be wired to an account, a custodian account, a bank account, whatever it is, if it's stock or cash. And so there was a report going around Silicon Valley that somebody had taken a famous, a notable person's voice and then did a dialer and then attempted to change the distribution path of shares coming out of a venture firm to a partner or an LP, which I don't know, was a GP, a general partner working at the firm or an LP who was an investor in the firm. So have people started using voice now to, to kind of, uh, and then these AI I, voice generators? I, I haven't seen it yet, but absolutely, right? It's the, the other beautiful thing there is caller ID is incredibly fragile and easy, easy to spoof. Yeah. So the second you call someone and it says that it's, you know, 
Jason calling me and it's your voice. How do you not go buy those Amazon gift cards? Starting a business used to be a pain. You needed a lawyer. There were hidden fees. It was a mess. Now with Northwest Registered Agent, it only takes 10 clicks and 10 minutes. Northwest provides everything you need to start and maintain your business. Every LLC, corporation, or nonprofit that Northwest forms comes equipped with registered agent service, a business address, a website, and hosting, email, a phone number, and this is all covered by Northwest's privacy by default. Again, your full business identity will be live in 10 minutes and in 10 clicks. So here's your call to action. For $39 plus state fees, they'll form your LLC, corporation, or nonprofit and launch your business in just minutes. Visit northwestregisteredagent.com slash twist today. That's northwestregisteredagent.com slash twist today. Social media seems to be another vector. I get DMs all the time from people trying to get me to send Bitcoin or receive Bitcoin, whatever. (laughs) But then people create fake versions of you online and mirror your entire account and then try to get people. And I get DMs on my main account, the verified account all the time saying, hey, um, did you want me to send you those Bitcoins? And I'm like, yeah, no. I send you three Bitcoins and you're going to send me 300 back, right? This seems to be something that's now becoming de rigueur, but oh, people are getting smarter it, to it, right? Never it send money. Also, it also um, makes KYC really difficult where you have online banking and people don't want to go into a branch and show their driver's license and have someone be like, so you end up with like, we're going to do a video chat right? Like hold your driver's license up. And all of that is all fakeable now. So never do that. Yeah. It's not that you should never do it. It's, it's just, there's more vulnerability, the, the more connected. So two factor strong passwords. If people just did that, how much of this problem would be solved if multi-factor and multi-factor helps a lot. The problem that you're seeing is the companies that are going down, the Caesars and MGMs, they had multi-factor. They How did they get around multi? How do they compromise they multi-factor? Okta. Oh wow! Okta, for people who don't know, is like an authentication management platform. Yeah. It's got passwords in it. It's got its own two-factor. But they had, if they got, wow, does it Okta now have liability then? Possibly, right? Like who knows? That's that's a a much. Wow. I don't think anyone's really been held liable for a security vulnerability in their product that resulted in somebody else getting hacked. Right? Like Microsoft and Apple would be the two largest defenders in the world. Talk to me about these uh, infrastructures. I know that we had a, the, was it the Colonial Pipeline, if yeah. I'm remembering correctly? So explain what, because that's a different goal. That's not just money. Now, this is like serious espionage level, trying to damage another country. So, how real is that? And, and how prepared are we for it? That's the interesting thing. It was financial. It was an espionage. And it was over the line of espionage, right? Like nobody's been willing to carry out an espionage style attack of that magnitude mm. on U.S. soil, right? You end up with a proportional response. Take out our pipeline, we'll take out two of yours. Because it was a cybercrime group, they got away with it. There wasn't a proportional response. That wasn't what happened in that. If you know what happened in that situation and and how did it go down? There were attackers that were in the the network for some time. They ended up installing it, uh, some new security software where they noticed that there were some irregularities. It tipped off the attackers that they were onto them and they, they encrypted all of the machines. They didn't go, into the actual pipeline computers, but they took all of the the back end office computers, you know, essentially offline, and then demanded a, a ransom to to allow uh, Colonial to regain control of their computers and turn everything back. And this was another one of these like payoffs with Bitcoin. I know the DOJ in this case somehow recovered some of those. They exfilled stuff to Amazon. And so they were able, they were bouncing through like an AWS host. And so they were able to, you know, the the FBI, the Secret Service, U.S. Marshals have relationships with those cloud providers. But the second that you get out of something like that, or, you know, frankly, they left stuff around. Uh, if they had just moved it all the way off, they wouldn't have been able to recover anything. Totally get 
when people steal the data, the releasing of the data or the selling of the data, that's a super attack vector. But when they encrypt you know, a machine, why don't people have backups? Why are these things not duplicated or redundant in some way? While they encrypt the machine, they go and they encrypt the backups or they delete them. <laughs> Right. Wow. Like if so you have know, the ability to write yeah. to a backup, yeah, they, they profile it. The interesting thing yeah. is, you know, lots of people have offline backups, you know, DLT, tape drives, Iron Mountain, yeah. all that. The logistics of importing that backup data takes weeks. There's Got not it. enough bandwidth on your network to be like, let's restore every system at the same time. Got it. So they're so sophisticated that they uh, know where the backups are, they encrypt them as well, at least the online ones that are redundant. They get the topography of the network, boom, they just I mean, take the all the way down. all the way down to they corrupt the like host based snapshots. Like Windows has a service called the volume shadow service, where you know, if an update goes bad or something like that, you can snap back. They'll actually corrupt that out in every major piece of ransom. Wow. It's one of the the indicators that we actually use for for stopping ransomware is tampering with that backup service. Ah, so if somebody starts effing with your backup service, that's when you know somebody's in there doing something. It's one of the signs. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me more about your software and solution. H how do you implement it, and, and uh, how can uh, how, how does it stop people? Is this like a constant game of cat and mouse where you constantly have to update it, like yeah. the virus software people do? I, I mean, the the nice thing about it is that's where, you know, AI really comes in and, and gives some superpowers instead of, you know, thousands of people sitting, writing, you know, regex signatures. Um, you know, we, we are using um, multiple different types of machine learning to, to build models that, that help uh, identify both from a pre-execution before it runs, as well as the behavior when something's actually... Uh, running to say we think this is bad let's stop it but where we're the the best way to think about us is we're the first complementary layer to antivirus so for years everyone said you you don't want to run two antiviruses on the same machine because they'll step on each other and conflict yeah so we were the first product where we said let's build ourselves to be a layer behind not try to replace the defenders the the crowd strikes that are out there Right. And then just focus on the threat of ransomware. So yeah. instead of trying to stop everything that's out there, we focus on these, you know, 200, 300 ransomware groups. What are the tools that you're, they're using? What are the techniques? And then we use that to build, um, you know, kind of like a multi layered protection strategy. But where we really differentiate is we're the first endpoint product ever to be focused on recovery, too where because these guys are so sophisticated, they have so much resources, they're going to figure out how to beat everything at, at some point. But because they do encryption on the host, we actually capture the, the key material, the symmetric keys, the entropy, and we can um, reconstitute that data for the users without them having to interact with a ransomware group if if yeah, everything see, fails a, and they get ransomware. This is a key thing. They have to encrypt it in order to give you the keys to unencrypt it. So that step it. in the process was such a brilliant stroke for them. However, it doesn't take all that much technology to know a machine is doing something with encryption in real time on that server, right? Or on that yeah, desktop. Well, I'm not sure if they, which way they go after. There's a lot of encryption that's going on on host nowadays too, right? So there's a delicate balance between, you know, profiling something that's backup software. We, I mean, we also focus on the data protection side, right? When they come and they steal that data before they encrypt, um, we have a network driver. So we'll actually detect that, that data exfil going and, and block it. Their tactics, you, you said cat and mouse. I mean, it's, it's completely appropriate. Their tactics change constantly. They're always looking for a way to uh, deliver more impact quicker. This is now becoming, in terms of corporate governance, a board level issue. Like when these things happen, I remember Uber had a big hack and then somebody didn't report it or they try, cause you know, sometimes somebody is embarrassed by it and they try to, 
you know, maybe yeah, resolve it before it escalates. This is getting very dangerous for companies and boards because they ultimately are responsible for knowing about these things. So what's the what's the state of the it's affairs getting dangerous now with boards? For, for the CSEPs, right? So in that Uber case, the person that got prosecuted was the chief information security officer. It's the same thing with the SolarWinds hack. If you remember that, the SEC just filed charges against the chief information security officer there. So if a CISO, which is chief information security officer, for people don't know, if a CISO doesn't do their duty to report hacks, that's criminal behavior now or it's? Apparently, right? There yeah. isn't a lot of clear guidance on what's good and bad. The industry has taken up with this concept of bug magnets, where you as an individual can go out and find a vulnerability in Uber. And then reach out to them and say, hey, Uber, I found this vulnerability. Here's my proof. Write me a check. What's the difference between that and somebody hacking you and asking yeah. for a ransom? Right? Like attitude? Um, I guess it would be the threat of taking the system down and giving it to other people as opposed to politely asking, can I get 10 grand for this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's I mean, what I found. Well, I guess it would be the always... approach. And also, I guess being anonymous versus not being anonymous would be another... I mean, absolutely. Person. You can always ask politely first and if they don't agree, escalate, right? But it's it gets confusing from a legal perspective, yeah. right? Where if you look at that Uber case and what they prosecuted that CISO for, it seemed like something that was very common that's done in corporations across the country every day. All right, listen, selling software is hard. It's hard right now, right? 2022, 2023, it's been a grind. 2024, it's going to be hard too. Everybody's making very thoughtful decisions. And the last thing you need is to slow your sales team down because you don't have your SOC queue dialed in. So if you're a SaaS or services company that stores customer data in the cloud, you need to check out Vanta. Vanta will get your startup SOC 2 compliant easier and faster. Vanta makes it really easy to get and renew your SOC 2. On average, Vanta customers are SOC 2 compliant in just two to four weeks. Compare that to three to five months without Vanta. Vanta can save you hundreds of hours of work and up to 85% on compliance costs. And Vanta does more than just SOC 2. They also automate up to 90% compliance for GDPR, HIPAA, and more. You can't afford to lose out on major customers because of silly stuff like lacking compliance. Just work with Vanta. Get your compliance automated and tight. Tight is right. And close those big deals, the lighthouse deals that send all the other customers to you. Here's the call to action. It's very simple. Vanta is going to give you a thousand dollars off at vanta.com slash twist that's vanta.com slash twist to collect a thousand dollars off your sock too talk to me about encryption long term because there have been rumblings uh especially during this open ai brouhaha with sam altman being fired and rehired and all that kind of stuff that you know they might have uh this was one of the theories that they might have with, you know, LLMs and, and just the brute force they have been able to figure out how to unencrypt stuff or break some encryption. So is that disaster scenario that people put in the quantum, you know, computing, oh, it's only going to happen when quantum computers come out, they're going to break encryption and whatever. We'll, we'll see that coming. But then LLMs, we didn't see coming, at least not at this velocity. So is, is that real or scare tactics or... Encryption's been broken a bunch of times before. And what happens is it gets broken. There's no instant uh, scale of attackers. So the attackers exploit it. Everyone responds, they replace it, and then we go on to the next one, right? Like it's the reason why we don't have web on our Wi Fi anymore and we're not using SSL one anymore. Encryption's always going to get compromised. Right. It's just you have to be dynamic and use it in a way where you can adapt and, and move to new standards and algorithms. But you're already seeing quantum resistant crypto. Explain what this is for the audience. Yeah. Cryptography that theoretically, and it, it's just theoretical right now because no one's been able to actually prove it, is resistant to, um, you know, a, a scale general purpose quantum computer being able to break the encryption, right? So the majority of, you know, like cryptocurrency and stuff like that, theoretically with a strong enough quantum computer, you can unravel the, the blockchain, right? But people have identified it. We've known that this is going to be a problem for a long time. And 
And there are numerous companies working on being the next, you know, quantum resistant cryptography company. What do you recommend for startups, people who are, you know, running fast growing companies uh, in terms of being, because you, you can't afford a CISO, you know, you're a 20, 30, 40 person company. What, what's the be- best practices? Just use a great cloud computing provider, have great two factor. I mean, there are some fabulous managed services companies that are out there, right? That specialize in security that, you know, are affordable, have access to, you know, a suite of the the best in class technologies that are out there. This is going to sound crazy, but, you know, big companies like Dow, right? Like these are serious problems to them and they have real solutions to it. So you can actually go out and engage with, the, the manufacturers, right? I'm less with Apple than everyone else. But, you know, Microsoft has a huge security suite product offering. Should people be using physical keys? I mean, uh, there's been a lot made of like um, people being able to spoof SIM cards in order to get two factor. It seems like the majors, the, you know, the, the Verizons of the world, yeah. Google Fi's are starting to lock this down. So they, they kind of get it. But there have been very interesting edge cases of people being able to figure out how to get eSIM. So should people be using, what's that key that everybody uses, QB or something that you see? UB yeah. keys, UB right? keys. Should people start moving to those kind of things? Is that going to, and does that actually really solve the problem? Maybe for now, right? Like the majority of people, I, I use my phone for my multi-factor. And you run into an issue of, what happens when your phone gets compromised, which I, I don't know if you've seen the news, but there was, you know, this uh, um, highly sophisticated iOS tool chain that, that just came out where they were hacking iPhones and, and there was no way of knowing that, that you were compromised. You know, it's, it's layers of due diligence, right? I, I wish that there was some, if you use this, you're protected, but in this world, there's always a way to engineer hack around kind of any security technology that gets deployed, which is why it really comes down to to having layers and being able to detect when something's been penetrated and have mitigating controls and and response plans and the right partners. How much of this is moved to China now and and North Korea? Are those sophisticated players in all this? Is it still in Eastern Europe? Oh, no, they're, they're highly sophisticated. I mean, the interesting thing with North Korea is when you look at the the top four, you know, non Five Eyes nation states, you've got China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, right? The old access of evil, as uh, I think Bush called them. Yeah, North Korea operates and and became one of the top four with zero dollars of state funding. All oh, of really? their yeah, all of their funding for computer hacking they steal. Like they, they were really they're big with, they're bootstrapped. Uh, they're absolutely bootstrapped. They were a <laughs> big fan of, um, you know, the, the banking protocol Swift. They would go in and, and hack Swift transactions and just steal money that way. What about Iran? It's very interesting. Is Iran have, or Iran <laughs> have a so big Ar- capacity? Iran has, um, not a large capacity, but they're getting really sophisticated. So they were essentially kind of late to the game. But you saw probably 10 years ago, they started taking on serious targets. They, they were able to compromise the, it's, uh, the Navy Marine Corps intranet. You know, they got a bunch of like nuclear research stuff from a bunch of universities. But yeah, I, I mean, they're continuing to gain sophistication with essentially the rest of the world, right? Like as this information is becoming more accessible to everyone they definitely have the motivation and the access to to everything that they need to play out some major attacks they're, the governments they're, turn a blind eye to this but they or do they support it are they training people you know are they getting a vig and a piece of the action you would think in a place like north korea maybe the supreme leader would want a piece of the action and would see this as a revenue stream potentially um yeah how, I mean, how do the governments I mean, in each of these places participate in this or not it's normally state sponsored, right? Like right. if you look at even, you know, Russia, China, like all of these um, attacker groups have direct ties to uh, military intelligence. So they exist outside of the military and outside of the government. Moonlight. But they're, they're moonlighting. It's your, ah. Yeah, it's your, it's your nights and weekends job. 
you don't make a lot working for the government, but they've always been supportive of people kind of taking those tools and using them to attack their enemies, right? Like there's no, if, if you go and hack, you know, a giant American company as a Chinese, North Korean, Iranian citizen, and it, it gets publicly released that you're the one that did it, there, there's no consequence. China used to hold competitions at universities where they'd go and who could hack some American company the best? Okay, lightning round here. There's been rumors Bitcoin, Tor, the Tor network, for people who don't know, is a, a relay system to anonymously surf the internet. It's where all the dark web transactions are. There's been rumors those things could have been CIA or government sponsored, honeypots, et cetera. What do you think? It, it's definitely not conspiracy, right? Like, I don't think that it's something that they're the whole system. But yeah, I mean, if you're operating on tour and you think that you're completely anonymous and the U.S. government and intel agencies aren't operating tour exit nodes, you're delusional. Yeah. Right. Like it's absolutely in those decentralized environments, they're going to invest and collect. It, it just comes down with what's their motivation to do something about it. How good is America when compared to uh, you know our hacking ability cuz you're in the community people in the community sometimes get called up to duty or get pulled into operations etc and there's a big tradition of that here uh it's very quiet obviously how good are we compared to the other places yeah so prior to starting Halcyon I I started a company where we exclusively worked with the, the US intelligence community doing sophisticated cyber operations we are the best Right. We have the best capabilities. We have capabilities that most people can't fully comprehend. What do we use them for? That's the problem. Right. Like, are they being used for the right things? Do the, the groups that have these capabilities get the right mission handed down to them that allows them to get the maximum value? I think politically, we don't really understand computer hacking yet. I don't think a lot of politicians understand how computers work and the threats we're vulnerable to. But from a capability perspective, it's fantastic, right? Like better than you could imagine. It's yeah, just we, we, we don't hear about it, which I think is a really good thing. Like our techniques, this is why when a lot <laughs> of, you know, I mean, not to be yeah. political or anything, but like, you know, Trump having certain papers that have in them at Mar-a-Lago or maybe other presidents have them too that have those techniques in them, right? I think they call them methods and whatever and sources. It's really important that we don't use these tools that we have or let people know we even have them. Like we got some sophisticated stuff that we just don't want people to know we have them. Yeah, yeah, it's different classes, right? There's stuff that you have to sit on the shelf just for an emergency, right? Life or death, the world's gonna end. Like that's when we pull that one off. But they're, they're different calibers, right? Where it's, you know, you have your everyday tools that you run. Like there's, there is no shortage of, of capabilities for cyber in the U.S. intelligence community. We spend a lot of money on, on making sure that the, the U.S. has omniscient like cyber capabilities. Omniscient like cyber capabilities. I like the sound of that. If yeah. in the right hands. I mean, obviously these can be used for nefarious purposes too. We got to be vigilant about them. I mean, there's abuse well, on the margins, but generally it seems like we do the right thing as a country. Yeah, very much. I mean, I think that there's a lot more that we could be doing, but people are scared. You know, it's something where privacy becomes very fluid. And, you know, once you erode at that, you can never really pull it back. Yeah. I mean, if the amount of access we probably have to an average person's phone as a government is pretty amazing. People think that their signal or some of these encryption things are bulletproof. You would say no. Absolutely not. Right. So the, the interesting thing with, with those messaging applications is in so many cases, even when something is deleted, it's still left on the phone, right? Cause you end up with a database of messages and you don't go back and delete lines out of a database on a cell phone. It's a battery device. You just flag it as deleted. There's so much information on your devices that once it gets kind of captured by one of these, you know, government tools or programs. Um, it's, a, it's a little unimaginable. On how yeah, much your privacy is an illusion. 100%. If we then extrapolate that to TikTok and the Chinese government having access to it, describe for the audience what 
they would be capable of doing with 50, 100, 100 million Americans and the access they have on the average phone? What, what could they be doing with that data? It's interesting, right? Because there are legitimate ways to gather data on phones and then the illegitimate ways to gather data on phones. Yeah, right? example. And yeah give me an example. So you remember when iPhone came out with uh, uh, allow this application to get access to your clipboard? Yes. That was in response to applications were just always reading what was on your clipboard, right? Yes. And then sending it Which to Which is your cloud. password. People cut and paste their password all the time from their yeah, password manager. Yeah, if you're manager. using a password manager. Yeah, absolutely. So you so, basically given the Chinese all your passwords and they've got five or six different passwords in there. And if you're a typical American, you're probably not using a random generator. So they just got not. your Gmail, just gave them Bank of America, gave them everything else. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of metadata that you can take off of phones. I will say this. TikTok probably isn't going to be their only source of this information. There are a lot of core services that mobile applications are built upon that data can be mined from, I, I guess would be the best way to put it. You know, as long as, as you're comfortable with the fact that privacy is an illusion and you should do everything like somebody's looking over your shoulder, you'll be fine. Yeah. I mean, that is what people should be, should be doing, right? Yeah. Especially with digital devices, right? If you want some privacy, get a friend, go out into the forest, leave your phones behind. Them. When we look at Apple as an actor here, they've been, at least publicly, it seems like they're in the corner of protecting individuals' rights to privacy more than anybody. They're not an ad-based business. Encryption. Uh, and the fact that they wouldn't unlock the San Bernardino uh, shooter's phone, if you remember that instance, they had yeah, to use an Israeli tool to do it. Mm -hmm. So is Apple and being on the Apple ecosystem the best choice for consumers because Apple has that default of, you know, lock it down and only the user has it and we don't have your information on some server at, or in a lot of cases, they t say they don't have it. I trust Apple the most, I guess, would okay. be the, the best way to put it. You know, you end up with a homogenization kind of problem where... If I want to hack you and you're an Apple guy, I can go out and buy a zero day that doesn't just allow me to hack your Apple phone. It allows me to hack every Apple phone in the world because they're all the same. Yeah. Right. Everything's universal. And so you end up with this be because you're in the majority, everyone's going to always have access to that. Right. Like being able to get on an Apple phone is bread and butter for an intelligence agency, federal law enforcement. Like you said, they, they couldn't get in the San Bernardino shooter's phone, so they went to an Israeli company, right? The capability is always there. Yeah. Um, where if you want to be really, really secure, find the most obscure phone that you can think of and, and use that because nobody's going to go through the effort of Ah. You know, buying or building a tool to get into something that unique. What's the biggest threat? We'll end on this. The biggest threat that keeps you up at night, just in terms of hacking globally, uh, oh. you know, beyond your company and what you do. What I mean, you? you're a venture capitalist. I was going to say interest rates, but if you're going to take <laughs> me back to hacking, right? Yeah, back to hacking. I mean, it's it's our infrastructure, right? Yeah. If you look at, did you make it to the Super Bowl in Tampa? You seem like the type of guy that would go to no, the Super I Bowl. No, I didn't. I didn't get, yeah, I've been to a Super Bowl. I went to the 49ers one one time, yeah. So a week before the Super Bowl happened in Tampa, the Tampa Water District got hacked and somebody tried to poison the water. What? I was totally unaware of that. Mm -hmm. Wow. They, they stopped it because somebody was literally sitting at the computer and saw someone else moving the mess. Whoa, that's an unplug the computer moment. Yeah. Holy yeah. cow. Attacks like that are so much easier than anyone realizes right now for the level of sophistication of these attacks. How do they get the poison into the water? Would they just like up the amount fluoride. of fluoride? Yeah. I was yeah say, I they just, they just 100x the fluoride. Boom. Yeah. You, whatever. Oh, wow. Transportation infrastructure, right? Like um, hospitals, right? Manufacturing. What happens if the oil companies get shut down for a week, right? You yeah. end up where we've built this, this entire supply chain that's as close to just in time as we can get. And you start dropping computer outages there and, and stuff unravels, right? Yeah. People die. 
People, I mean, Americans are dying all of the time now from cyber attacks. And we're doing nothing. That's incredible. Yeah, because of hospitals, because of supply chain yeah. and, and these kind of things going yeah. down. Yeah, the, I mean, the hospitals specifically. And that is a target, huh? They want to target hospitals because they know it's mission critical and they're just going to call the ransom. You got to have no choice. You got to pay. Yeah. Yeah. This is why things that are redundant are good. Uh, this is one thing we learned during COVID. Like if all of the medicine we have in this country comes from one other country, that's a communist country that maybe is an arrival. Maybe we should make some of those drugs here. Um, yeah. yeah. It's just not cheap. Right. Like that's the problem. Like all of this is just more capital that, that is expensive right now. And, and people don't want to spend if the problems Solved, that is a challenge with solved. capitalism. Capitalism finds the cheapest path, and yeah. the cheapest path is a dependency. You then have to say, we want redundancy is more important than the lower price. Absolutely. And I think, I think Americans are starting to see that. You see that with people putting solar and generators and having Starlink and their landline. People are starting, I mean, putting preppers aside, just being off-grid, having a well, Having a generator, it, it's it's not like you're a kook anymore for having those. I get the sense that you thank have all those things. You, thank, I have all of those things. Right? Thank I you mean, for calling me not a kook. I, I literally am putting generators in both my houses. Uh, mm-hmm. My cyber truck, when it comes, is the equivalent of 11 power walls or something. So I'm going to have a cyber truck. That's 11 power walls. I have sa- star links. So yeah, I'm, I'm big into the redundancy. You don't have cyber truck yet? I thought you're Elon's friend. You don't get it right <laughs> away? I, I literally just traded emails with him about it. <laughs> he yeah. pushed me up. He's going to get me one of the foundation series, I think. I, you know, here's the thing. I always... If you want to if you want to throw in a word for me too, I pre-ordered yes, mine. Move up the li- I think he's going to sell every one of these he can make. I, I think this, the sneaky part of that product is the inverter and that you can plug it into your home and it's 11 power walls. You just think about if you live in Texas and you're going to buy a truck and yeah, you see... I mean, like, I have three power walls right now and it's pretty good, but... I really could have gone with like six. But three power walls will get you through like two days or a day. I I, I mean, it, it gets me all the way off grid if I'm not running my air conditioning. Yeah. So you're in pretty good shape. If you have a cyber truck and it's got 11 of these or nine, whatever the equivalent run my is, AC. you can run your AC. You could be doing loads of dishes yeah. and yeah. it just will change how we look at the power grid itself. And that's the ultimate redundancy. Like, how do you hack that? It's going to be pretty hard to hack. I think it's huge, right? Having that kind of power independence, especially where our grid is so fragile. If you take down, I think it's like nine or 11 substations. And I'm yeah. talking about like a bomb on a quadcopter and you just fly it in and kaboom. Yeah, the this entire could be like nation's a, power grid goes down. And you think about how insane that is. You could just literally do nine Oklahoma City bombings, God forbid. Not not even that big. You not even that big. You do it in a, a Toyota Corolla. Yeah. quadcopter. And right, and your own homemade explosive and have 10 buddies do it all at the same time and, and you just blacked out the entire United States. It's, it's madness. And this is where I, and the, I, the next thing I want to buy. Before. It hasn't, hasn't happened. happened. Yeah. Black Swan events do happen though. And we can yeah. predict them now, which means we should be doing it. The thing I want to get is there are these um, panels that are like solar panels. You put them on your roof or you put them in your backyard and they take moisture out of the air. They're like, dehumidifier kind of things or and you can basically get enough water to survive and drink off of with a couple panels for your family of whatever three four five i don't know i if saw you have that, that on yet. star trek and when i was watching in the 90s captain now Picard built something like there's that. a startup there's a startup making them and so yeah, it's I, I mean it's fantastic i have a well right so yeah. I've, I've already got plenty of water but um yeah, that's the next piece water yeah, electricity I mean, and internet what else do you and need the second the second you can do all that stuff off grid with Starlink, giving you 350 megs a second wherever you want. Like I just put Starlink in my ski house and I got over 200, 250 megabit. And I was like, what? Getting, when I first tried this, uh, you're getting three? 350 on mine right now. That's nuts. Yeah. And then, yeah. Are you on it right now? Is this uh No, I have it as a, a backup. Yeah. So that's what I do is I have the router uses mine as the backup, but. I think it's getting to the point with the latency going down that you could actually load balance and you wouldn't be giving anything up versus your cable modem. My head of services lives in like a rural town in Colorado and there's no broadband there. He's been on Starlink since it first dropped and, you know, he does Zooms, demos, everything works great. Like, it's Wait, do you see it on an airplane? I, I, was on an air, I was on an airplane with it and it was 
Bonkers. Oh my goodness. I mean, I, you know, it's the, the gist of the internet coming to planes was so transformative for me. Like having the actual real sure. bandwidth there is going to be. It's bonkers. It's, gonna, it's really going to change how people look at, you know, taking long haul flights. Like the fact that you can just literally turn on Netflix and then have two other people turn on Netflix and stream something. And you're like, wait a second. This I mean, is every time, every, every night before I travel, you got to get it out and make sure everything's downloaded and synced yeah. and your DRM is renewed. And yeah, yeah no, Nonsense. having a real connection would be great. Where can people find out more about your, your company? And I know you're hiring. You've done great in terms of raising money. And uh, so who are you hiring for? Where can people Halcyon, find out? Halcyon. Halcyon.ai. And that's just because, you know, we can't afford the, the dot com yet. Maybe one day we'll get there. I think actually the AI is probably better right now. Yeah. It is the right time of year for AI companies, right? Absolutely. But yeah, and then, you know, major kind of security channels and partners. If somebody has a, a security partner that they're they're working with, odds are we're kind of partnered with them. But And hiring. We're definitely hiring the engineers and sales guys. Come Perfect. on over. You got it. Right? All right. And we'll see everybody next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. 